talking today with Joe Grimm of Affiliate Inc., uh, who is the editor of the Grand Valley State University Women's History Project. Okay, now, Mr. Grimm, can you begin by giving us just a little bit of basic background on yourself? Uh, start with where and when were you born? I was born uh, February 17, 1950, in Portsmouth, Virginia. All right. And what did your family do at that time? My dad uh, just uh, got out of the service. Uh, he was in the Merchant Marines during World War II. And uh, uh, the, my uncle was living in Michigan and uh, proposed to him to move to Michigan and uh, to seek work uh, in the automotive industry, which was obviously flourishing back then. And uh, so I was two years old. We relocated to uh, Utica. Michigan, and uh, I, I reside there until uh, uh, about 14 years old. Okay. And then uh, where did you move after that? Uh, we lived on a farm. Uh, my dad did odd, odd things. He worked at a steel mill uh, almost his entire life, and uh, plus we, we had a, a full-time farm. And then uh, about, uh, as I said, at the age of 14, they decided that uh, it was time to move on. We moved to Rochester uh, area, and bought a home, and, and relocated there. Okay. And the deacon, what kind of work was he doing then? Yeah, he was still working in a steel mill. Okay. okay. Now, did you finish high school? I did not. I actually uh, quit school. I was 16 years old. Uh, uh, met my, at, at the time, uh, was going to be my wife uh, when we were 15. And uh, unusual circumstances, we decided that we wanted to get married. And you know, we got married at 16. We both quit school. and. Uh, uh, started a life. Okay, and then what kind of work did you do then? Um, at 16, it was it was tough. I did uh, odd jobs, worked uh, worked for contractors, uh, did tile work, um, uh, made pizzas, anything you could do at 16 years old to make a living for your family. All right, and then how long did you continue on that before you went into the military? Um, I was. Uh, 17 when I decided to uh, enter in the military. So uh, for about a year, and then said it's uh, I needed to have something where I had steady income coming in. And uh, Vietnam War was was going uh, was going on, and uh, anticipated that I'd go to Vietnam as soon as I uh, applied for the military. But you know, it was something I was willing to do. All right. Now, what year was that? Uh, I went to service in uh, March of 1967. Okay. Now at that time. What did you know about Vietnam or the Vietnam War? I knew very little, to be honest with you, other than what was portrayed uh, on TV. I'd catch a few newscasts, but um, really didn't know anything about it. I, you know, again, I grew up kind of as a farm boy, was, uh, uh, was kind of backwoods. He didn't understand a lot about uh, the real world. Um, and so, uh, uh, either going to Vietnam was going to be an adventure and something because I'd never been away from home. This was going to be unique and different, so, right. and, it, and it was. Okay. Uh, now, what did your family think of this idea? Uh, they were not too keen on, on you going to the service, uh, especially my mother. She was very upset. Uh, again, she understood what was going on in Vietnam, again, from what she saw on TV, and uh, was definitely afraid that, you know, I was not going to return. Right. Okay. Now, where did they send you then for basic training? Uh, I went to Fort Knox. How would you describe uh, that facility and the training experience in, in basic? Boy, uh, so much different than what it is now. Uh, it, it was a rough time. I had uh, never been uh, so mistreated in my life, uh, yelled and cussed at and name called and, uh, uh, you know, up at the crack of dawn, which I was used to anyways, but to uh, have to go run, you know, three and four miles every morning. and carrying packs and and uh, didn't matter what uh, what the weather was like outside you were still out there uh, doing your marches and drills and training and uh, I was a little taken back I was a little worried that I was not going to be able to complete it what kind of physical shape were you in at the time actually I was uh, a pretty good shape again being a farm boy uh, uh, although I didn't work out never went to gyms uh, you, when you get up at five o'clock to feed the chickens and the hogs and and uh, you know, you work for two or three hours before going to school, and then getting back from school, going uh, right back to the farm to work. Uh, I was actually in pretty good shape. I was certainly much thinner. I was about 135 pounds. So. All right. Uh, did you have much trouble adjusting to, to the discipline and all the rest of the stuff that goes with army life? Actually, no. The, the discipline I thought was uh, was good. Actually, for for me, I was 
fairly disciplined anyways. Uh, you know, my mother and father taught me well. They, uh, they believed in discipline, and back then uh, it was a stick and a whip. Um, so I, I knew not to back talk or do anything wrong or, and to treat people the way they should be treated. So that, that actually f did fairly well for me uh, in the service, uh, actually throughout my entire career in service. All right. Uh, now, was there a point in basic training when you began to feel like, well, you were getting the hang of this or you could do it? Yeah, actually about, uh, about three or four weeks in, um, I had a very tall, muscular, um, a black drill sergeant, and uh, he seemed to take a liking to me, I guess, because of my, my uh, backwoods uh, thinking. You know, I, I didn't smoke and I didn't drink, and uh, uh, so he kind of took me aside and, and would give me hints, uh, uh, you know, after, after hours, you know, like, hey, you need to look at this, you need to try this, uh, this is what you need to work on. And uh, uh, I guess that one-on-one -on -one experience from him, even though he was one gruff, mean SOB during drill uh, treated me uh, kindly and with respect and, and uh, gave me a new focus on it. I, I then realized that, you know, this was not going to be as hard as, you know, I thought it was, so. Uh, and then where do they send you after basic? Or what do you do next? I thought I was going to go to Vietnam, but at the, I was told at that time that uh, you had to be 18 years old to go to Vietnam. So uh, my aptitude test, uh, I guess, showed uh, very well mechanical ability, so they sent me to Fort Rucker to train as a uh, crew chief on helicopters. Okay, and where is Fort Rucker? Fort Rucker, Alabama. All right. Uh, crew chief on helicopters, so what does that uh, kind of job consist of? Well, that was uh, performing the day-to-day -day maintenance, uh, uh, keeping the helicopter in tip-top shape. Uh, it, it was actually a good part of all the maintenance that was required, um, uh, even to the point of uh, what they call depot maintenance, going into the second and third echelon of maintenance. Uh, but your sole purpose in life was to maintain that helicopter daily and then fly with it when it flew, uh, helping the pilots um, land and take off safely, and then if you had mechanical problems, take care of those uh, as soon as possible. Now, what type or types of helicopter did you train in? At that time, they were UH-1 uh, UH uh, Delta models. And can you describe that for a layperson? What, what did that look like? What did you do? Yeah, it was... Um, well, it was, a, it was a standard helicopter that was primarily used during Vietnam. Um, uh, it, was, it was made by Bell Helicopters. It, it carried uh, roughly eight to ten passengers in the back. It had a bench row seats, um, and then uh, two cubby holes, one on each, each side that the gunner or crew chief would sit in, um, and then a pilot and co-pilot, um, uh, both of them having controls of the, of, of the aircraft. It was a single rotor, uh, uh, fully articulated system with a, uh, a tail rotor. They would have uh, 50 caliber machine guns on each side, so you... M60 machine guns. M60, 50 yes. caliber. No, not 50 caliber. That's 30. That's, yeah, 7.62 uh, um, okay. M60 machine guns, yeah. Okay, so basically, in addition to being a repairman, you also do double duty as a gunner when the occasion arises. It, it not in um, <coughs> non-war time or, you know, flying in, in CONUS or uh, in Europe, but in, in Vietnam, that is... Your, your, again, your primary function was to be a crew chief, but then when you flew, you, you then re, re, uh, reverted to being a gunner. Right. Okay. Uh, now, how long a process was that for you? Um, that was a, about two and a half month training after, after um, uh, basic training. And then uh, after I came out of what they call AIT, Advanced uh, Individual Training, uh, picked up the MOS, uh, then I stayed at uh, Fort Rucker. Um, uh, till I was, no, actually, no, I'm sorry, we, we moved. Um, no, I'm sorry, I, I did, I, stay after, I stayed at Fort Rucker after AIT. Uh, so I it continued to do training and flying with, uh, with a, as a crew chief only. Uh, then did they send you to Vietnam from there, or what happens next? Uh, yeah, I got orders uh, about a month after my 18th birthday, which is uh, kind of unique, and I kind of assumed it was going to be coming. Crew chiefs and gunners were in high demand because of the high fatality rate and, and uh, uh, injury rate in Vietnam. Um, I mean, you're in the direct line of fire, um, so they uh, they rotated those out fairly quickly and, and needed replacements. So, uh, within two and a half, three weeks after my 18th birthday, I received notification that I was going to go to Vietnam and then had my orders to to deploy. Uh, um, 
uh, in my hand probably a week later. Okay. Now, do they let you go home before they send you overseas? No. Okay. No, it's actually they, it was the last thing they wanted to do was have you leave uh, mm -hmm. their control at that time because there, there were still a lot of people uh, that were in the military for other reasons and had no intentions, uh, or they did not want to go to Vietnam, or when the time came that they had to go, you know, were uh, going AWOL. So uh, once you had your orders from Vietnam, they took tight control. All right. Now, what's the physical process by which they get you out to Vietnam? How do they get you there? Well, my case was uh, rather unique. Um, instead of going as, a, as an individual uh, where they deploy, where you'd actually uh, report to a duty station, they would load you up with your equipment uh, and then uh, put you on a plane and send you over there. They sent me to Fort Campbell, Kentucky for 30 days uh, as a deployment unit. They were building up a brand new unit um, and they were bringing in troops, uh, some with experience, some like myself were with uh, only a year experience, some straight out of AIT. Um, and then after they got as many people as they needed to, s to fill the uh, uh, positions, then they packed us all up uh, on a C-131, or I'm sorry, C-141, uh, with our uh, duffel bags on our backs, uh, our rifles in hand, uh, helmets on our head, and packed us like sardines into 141 and flew us straight to Vietnam. Okay. And was this the unit then that you served with while you were over there? Uh, actually, no. It's um, what they were doing in Vietnam when these new units uh, that had been activated and arrived in in uh, Vietnam the last thing they wanted was to have an entire unit of brand new uh, soldiers that had never served any time in Vietnam whatsoever. So as soon as you arrived, um, you'd go into the in, in processing and they would basically take about three quarters of those new people and scatter them around the country to, to the existing units and then uh, uh, rotate those troops that were, had already been there for five, six, eight months and put them in the new unit that was arriving so they could help train. Exactly. I wonder how that winds up working. All right. Uh, now, where did you first land in Vietnam? Uh, we landed in, um, actually we landed in Pleiku, which was unusual. Normally troops would arrive in Saigon and then they'd be bused or trucked to their unit. Um, <coughs> our unit, since we were a complete unit, and uh, uh, we landed right in uh, Pleiku, which is a, uh, an army airfield large enough to handle C-141s easily. And they lo uh, offloaded us there, um, and we, uh, again, our duffel bags and rifles and helmets in tow, uh, we went right over to an in-briefing uh, in, in, a, in a bleacher uh, setting, and from there went right into three days of Vietnam orientation. All right. What was your first impression of Vietnam? You kind of get off the plane and did you notice anything distinctive or not? I, uh, landing in an Army airfield, um, really didn't look a whole lot of different uh, other than you realize that, uh, you, know, you know, instead of concrete or asphalt uh, uh, runways, they were uh, what they call PSP or metal runways and uh, bunkers everywhere, sandbags, so you immediately realize that uh, you're, you're in hostile territory. Uh, but it was uh, hot and humid. Um, you know, again, growing up mostly in Michigan, I was not, I was not ready for that, uh, that immediate temperature change. It, it kind of sucked the breath right out of you when you, as soon as you open the door and step on the ground. Right. Now, what kind of information or orientation did you get then in those first three days? What did they do at that point? That was uh, pretty intense, uh, and uh, we actually uh, received training on, on uh, even though we'd had basic training on how, how to fire an M16, uh, they now gave you um, a little more detailed weapon uh, knowledge and how to use a weapon in combat, and they actually ran, ran us through a, a combat scenario. Uh, they went through um, medical uh, emergencies, how to handle bullet wounds, um, and then what to expect in Vietnam, uh, you know, from uh, when you get to your unit, uh, how long, uh, w when you plan to leave, or you know, what your, your rotation date would be. Uh, all in all, it was pretty good. Uh, uh, information. Uh, I don't think a lot of troops received that, but because I was coming direct to a to a unit, and we were an entire unit, uh, the training was was pretty intense and and uh, pretty knowledgeable. All right. 
And then what specific unit were you assigned to once you got through that process? Well, the unit I went to was actually called a, uh, it was a 480th uh, uh, TC, which was a, a Transportation Corps depot maintenance. So instead of being a crew chief, I was actually being sent over there to perform uh, uh, engine overhauls and transmission overhauls. Uh, but again, because they needed crew chiefs, uh, as soon as they looked at my MOS, uh, right when I arrived there, realized that not only did I have a, a maintenance background, um, but I was also a crew chief engineer. Uh, they immediately plucked me out of that and, and put me in, in a, uh, uh, at that time it was A Troop 717th Air Cav, which was a, uh, assigned or attached to the 4th Infantry Division. All right. Uh, and then what was your experience like when you actually joined that unit? Uh, that was very unique. I'd, I'd never been in that kind of uh, environment before. Uh, uh, very cliquish. <coughs> People, um, although they, uh, you, they looked at newbies as uh, uh, unusual characters, they didn't really want to associate with you when you first got there. And again, is that mentality, because I picked that up as well later on, that you don't want to make too good of friends because that friend may not be around too long, whether it be from an injury or death or rotation. Um, so you develop very short term relationships uh, uh, and then you find yourself finding one or two guys that, that uh, uh, would become close to you. But the rest of the group, you just, you, you just kind of stood off and, and weren't that close with them. All right, and physically, were, were they based at Pleiku or were they out in the field? We were bla based out of Pleiku at the actually Campanari. There were three base camps at Pleiku, and uh, uh, the 4th Infantry Division was headquartered at Campanari, and uh, our unit was um, kind of a, whatever the worst place was at Campanari, that's where they plucked this unit. You know, we, were, we weren't really part of 4th Infantry Division, so the division uh, personnel, you know, looked at us as a, uh, you know, we got to have them, but we really don't want them type of thing, so put them over here away from us. So uh, we, we lived in a, almost a swampy condition. It was uh, constantly underwater, um, a sandbag uh, with a wooden hooch, um, w which was our, our billets uh, where we slept. Uh, it actually, they put this up just before we got there. So they had wood sides with a, with a, uh, a tent top and then sandbag revetments all around. Uh, but a miserable location. Uh, uh, I think I saw a shower once every week, week and a half, even though we were in base camp, you know, that was, was you're fortunate to get a shower. Right. What did you actually do for the 4th Infantry unit that you were assigned to your job? <coughs> it was, uh, again, kind of a unique thing. The 4th uh, Infantry Division was, uh, they, they had a, a grid of uh, areas that they're responsible for, um, and they would assign us what they call a hunt-kill mission. We were a, an air cab unit, so we had uh, our own infantry assigned our unit, which um, uh, so we would carry our own infantry with us wherever we went. We had uh, a scout platoon, uh, which was of the uh, 086 um, scout birds. We had our own gunships, where at the time they were C-model gunships, um, later replaced with uh, Cobras. And then the lift platoon, which was uh, what I was assigned to as a gunner crew chief, were the UH-1, uh, at that time, D-model Hueys, to basically carry the, uh, the infantry to the locations and drop them off. And the 4th Infantry Division would give us a, um, several grids, and we would work those grids doing um, a hunt and search, and then when we locate the enemy, um, insert our ground troops and, and uh, use the gunships to suppress fire and, and, uh, and kill the enemy. All right. And since you were air mobile and maybe probably most of the rest of the 4th Division was not, did they give you guys the, the worst jobs or the ones that were farthest out? We, yeah, we worked further away. We would sometimes go and spend 30 to 45 days at, at fire bases um, because where we needed to work, uh, the grid we needed to do the hunt, kill, and search team uh, um, would be too far remote for us to get fuel. So they, they would relocate us to fire bases and we'd work out of those fire bases where we could have some security, um, get our fuel, eat meals and then fly out to the, uh, the our grid to work those grids during the day and come back sometimes at night sometimes uh, we'd find uh, other areas that that we could spend the night at and provide our own security with our own infantry mm -hmm. all right uh, now when you get there were you assigned to a specific helicopter with a specific crew or did they move you around 
Pilots would, uh, in most cases, would rotate around to different birds. Um, uh, the, a crew chief was assigned a helicopter, and that was your helicopter uh, for the length of your tour. Um, I, l I remember the last three of my, my aircraft. That's pretty much what you, you remembered. Everybody remembered your, your last three was 017. Um, and that's the bird I flew every day, and, and it was almost every day. Very seldom did you get a day off. Um, and then I had uh, a gunner assigned to me. Uh, even though I was a gunner, you need to have a gunner on the other side, and he would maintain and take care of your guns for you while I would do the maintenance on the aircraft. So every day, go out to the aircraft, do our maintenance, prepare for flight. The pilots would come out. Some pilots would try to uh, stick with the bird because they would get to know it. It, it had um, um, every aircraft had unusual characteristics, or you know, that were unique to that aircraft. Some were powered, uh, had a lot of power. Some were underpowered. You know, some maneuvered rather well. Um, some had vibrations that nobody wanted to fly. But so th sometimes the luck of the draw, the pilots, when they get there, the air mission commander would assign them the aircraft. Uh, so sometimes we'd get the same pilots several days in a row. Sometimes we'd get a new pilot. Uh. All right. Uh, Ed, do you remember the first time you went out in a combat mission? Uh, vaguely. It, uh, again, uh, the first um, 30 to 45 days, um, went real, real quick. I didn't, again, we're, wasn't sure what was going on. I was still had my, my country background. Um, wasn't used to, to doing the things that they did and, and how they did them. Uh, so first 30, 45 days, I don't really remember a whole lot about it. I just remembered it was, seemed like you were just laying down to go to sleep and they were getting you up, uh, uh, you know, or you were listening to rockets coming in at night and and uh, you know, I just wasn't prepared for that. You couldn't get to sleep. You, uh, um, you again, you didn't have any friendships. So it, it took a while, about almost two months, before I developed some some good friendships. And uh, then we started to have, uh, I don't, for lack of a better term, fun with the assignment. It wasn't it wasn't fun that first couple months. Okay, so you really kind of had to learn the ropes to figure out what exactly was going on and what you had to do. Yeah, yeah, it was a, you know, they really, uh, as a crew chief, um, they pretty much threw you to the wolves. Here's an aircraft, you're a crew chief, here's the logbook, um, do your thing. So you're just supposed to know what to do and, and always do it? Pretty much so, because yeah, you're, you're flying in combat, um, and I was, I was actually, after my initial three days of training, and then upon reassignment, they went through a uh, kind of a basic uh, what you need to do for the unit, this is where you need to sign in, this is the mess hall. Uh, the next day I was on a mission. Right. Now, uh, were the missions themselves this first day, were, were they dangerous? Were, were they getting shot at and shot down? Oh, constantly. Uh, I brought back pictures uh, from, of my tour and uh, uh, I've got pictures where, uh, I mean, we were riddled with bullet holes. There was almost as many patches on, a, on an aircraft as there was uh, the, the initial um, a sheet metal for the aircraft. All right. uh, now, were you ever on, uh, did any of the helicopters you fly, did they actually get shot down or disabled? Or? Uh, a number of them. Primarily uh, scout birds, which were, the, their sole mission in life was to actually go out there and be a flying target. Uh, there would be two small helicopters, room for, there's room for four people, but you'd only have a pilot and then a scout in the right seat. And then they, uh, uh, some of those had mini guns. Uh, um, some of them didn't have mini guns. They would just the scout would would uh, use an M16, uh, but they would fly around low level, right over top of the trees, uh, very slow, intentionally to draw fire. Also, to I mean, as a scout, you're you know, you're hoping you identify uh, a hostile, you know, before they identify you. But obviously, they can hear you coming from several miles around. So um, they would when tracers would come up towards them, and that's the first idea that you've, you've identified uh, the enemy is when you'd see the, the red tracers coming at you. Um, they would pop smoke and get out of the area as best as possible, call in the gunships to suppress fire, and then we'd be base camp somewhere with uh, our infantry. We would carry as many as, uh, as, many as 13 in an aircraft fully loaded with their packs and guns when it was really only rated for nine or 10 um, people, not including the pack. So we were usually flying over uh, overweight conditions at all the time, again, with high humidity, high altitudes. 
um, and we'd get a call from the command and control aircraft that they hit a hot spot and um, call in the infantry. We would actually find an LZ, go in, land, let the infantry off, and and uh, uh, report back to base camp and wait for them to call us back to pick them up. I did that for one year. Right. Yeah, same units, same guys, other than what they called d -ros. You know, people were because it's they staggered them, uh, putting new people, old people, and some some people who had, had extended their tours uh, remained in those units. Um, so you were constantly having people rotate in and out. But I stayed in that unit for the entire year. All right. Now, how would you generally characterize morale within the unit? What kind of attitude did the men take toward what they were doing? And Surprisingly, um, our unit, because we were a small unit and uh, we had a mission and uh, everybody had, uh, had a pretty good idea what they needed to do and we had to watch our own backs, uh, it was pretty good for the most sake. Uh, some of the, our infantry, I think, were a, a little upset. They didn't, you know, most of the infantry were usually your draftees. Uh, but most of the people that were pilots or um, uh, crew chiefs uh, have either volunteered for service or, you know, had a little bit better job than the infantry where you're out there ground pounding and you're in direct line of fire uh, whenever they insert you till the time they pick you up. Uh, but overall, morale was pretty good. All right. Now, were some phases of that year more intense than others in terms of the amount of fighting and the kind of fighting going on? Uh, at times, when we would well, there was one time we went to uh, Bami Tuit East, which was a base camp um, uh, in in the Central Highlands, and uh, it was a hotbed that entire area. Um, there was a lot of Viet Cong coming across the border from uh, uh, Laos, and at that time it was we were not allowed to fly into Laos or Cambodia, so there was no way to prevent these uh, Viet Cong from coming in, and so we they dispatched us down to a base camp and we stayed there for almost 90 days working out of a uh, out of tents and uh, cold meals and no showers uh, sour milk you know the whole the whole gamut uh, uh, and it seemed like every day we were flying into uh, uh, hot areas so you, we came back uh, almost every aircraft would have bullet holes uh, we had a number of people wounded, uh, primarily the infantry. A couple of pilots had been wounded. Um, several scout birds had been shot down. Uh, that that 90 days was uh, pretty tough. And then on, on top of that, they actually came in and, and uh, um, infiltrated our camp at night. And while we were sleeping in tents, we were throwing satchel charges into the tents. So uh, there was, uh, it being a base camp, uh, this was actually being run by the Air Force instead of the Army. and. Uh, Security was a little lax, so they actually came in and and uh, ran through the areas, throwing satchel charges are basically uh, bags filled with C4 or, or explosives, and they would pull a pin or light the fuse and throw them into the into the uh, tents where everybody was sleeping. So, so the people at the base they do that the, the cavalry guys would provide the security for them. Or no, we were usually gone all the time. They uh, the Air Force provided their own security. Um, it just that this was still a a fairly new base camp and nothing was really set up very well. Uh, nothing against the Air Force, but they, they tended to do things a little different than the Army. The Army would go in, set up an airfield, set up security, um, and start working. Where well, the Air Force would come in and set up their officers club, their NCO club, and the, the showers. And uh, you know, later down the road, you know, they would maybe get to uh, security and, and uh, you know, the other things that were necessary. Now, were you ever actually in the camp at the time one of these attacks took place? At that night, yeah, yeah. yes. Okay. Yeah. So what do you do when that starts? You just Run for cover, off? run for cover. Yeah, the, I mean, they're blowing, they're going off. Uh, fortunate for me, I was uh, third tent in the line, uh, so they'd already, uh, the first two tents, uh, uh, the satchel charges had already gone off. By the time they got to ours, we were already running for cover. Um, you just, uh, there wasn't a whole lot you could do because you didn't know, at, at dark time, you don't know who the enemy is, you can't see anything. Um, just find some bunkers or sandbags to get behind and, and lay low and, and uh, wait for the all clear. Now, were they just generally making trouble or were they trying to get to the helicopters? They were trying to blow up the helicopters, yeah. 
Did yeah. that ever work? Uh, not while I was there, no. We were pretty fortunate. After I left the unit, they did, um, uh, my unit relocated and they were able to go in and actually uh, destroy about 50% of the helicopters uh, one evening. But while we were there, uh, at that time, they were, they were actually, uh, our infantry uh, caught the infiltrators uh, after about the fourth or fifth satchel charge and they'd already caught the ones, uh, uh, killed the ones that were going towards the aircraft. So we had, they had basically three or four teams go after ammo, bunk ammo bunkers, go after personnel, and go after uh, aircraft. So. Uh, some of the actual experiences out in combat in your kind of phase where you spent about 90 days on the base away from Pledge Do, uh, in particular the intense activity. Was this a, now you're, you're there, did you're, during what you're serving over there, that's also when the Tet Offensive took place? Correct. And were you in Play 2 or were you uh, uh, no, actually, we were, uh, w again, we were assigned to a couple of areas. Actually, uh, uh, shortly after I arrived in, in, uh, in Vietnam, um, it was probably within 30 days, um, we were called in at night, probably about midnight, 1 o'clock in the morning, that uh, a base camp not far from us was being overrun. And uh, we loaded up, uh, uh, of course, we always carried weapons and ammunition ready to go. Um, so we loaded up even more because I said that uh, the base camp was, was not going to last much more than an, an hour. We needed to get there. It was about a 30 minute flight to get there. It's a place called Doc To. And uh, we arrived there. Uh, we had a couple of aircraft with uh, what they call light, uh, fire lights. Uh, they were 27 landing lights uh, all pooled together in a big circle and they, they would mount these inside the helicopter and it was like a huge searchlight. Um, so they, we flew those out there and lit up the area. As they were shooting flares off, which you can't have flares going off into the, by artillery rounds uh, with helicopters coming in to, uh, for support. And we lit up that area as we, we made our approaches in to see what, what the problem was. And uh, there were literally thousands of Viet Cong rushing um, the side of this base camp. It was actually on a, on a tall hill with strands of barbed wire, uh, actually eight strands, um, different levels, and claymore mines and uh, trip flares and everything you think of there to protect them. And there were literally uh, over a thousand, if not more, Viet Cong rushing them. And they had already approached onto the fifth strand of barbed wire by the time we got there, three to go before they actually in, uh, overrun the base camp. And uh, we lit that uh, area up with uh, the lights, could see that. You know, later on I realized that this was a, a tactic that, that Viet Cong had, had done, much like the Chinese and, and the Koreans had done during uh, previous wars, but sacrificed their bodies to go further up the hill, laying themselves on top of barbed wire, um, uh, knowing full well that they were going to be pummeled with uh, machine gun fire. They would basically just throw themselves until the, the next group or next wave could go the next, next leg up the hill. And uh, we lay down suppressive fire for four to six hours, uh, constantly go back, refuel, uh, reload, go back and, and continue to lay fire uh, until daylight and then it seemed to just disappear. And that was my first actual gun battle. Mm -hmm. And I realized that, uh, you know, if I encountered these, these Viet Cong, um, you know, as a, as a single soldier, I, they, uh, they impressed me as somebody that were willing to do anything for their, whether, whether it was their cause or their country or whatever, um, uh, it was going to be a tough, tough year ahead. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, did you see much of the South Vietnamese military personnel? We had several um, uh, embedded with us, uh, both as uh, uh, interrogators and some as interpreters. Uh, we, we did a lot with the Mountain Yards, which was uh, a group of tribesmen. Uh, I mean, as backwoods as you'll ever get, uh, loincloths, um, uh, using crossbows and, and bow and arrows to hunt with. And the Viet Cong hated them and were killing them. Um, so the military realized that early on in the, in the war and would go in and befriend them and um, provided them with weapons and they were true hunters. Um, they, they also hated the Viet Cong because they realized that uh, you know, their lives were at stake if they did not try to wipe them out. And uh, we would work a lot, because we were a small unit, we could work with, uh, uh, with them in, 
and uh, they would actually go flying with us and point out suspected Viet Cong areas and uh, um, for the most part uh, they were very helpful and, and uh, you could trust them but some of the South Vietnamese soldiers uh, weren't as trustworthy. Um, John, do you have any kind of first-hand experience of that or awareness of things that happened with your unit as far as that? Um, not actually, just uh, from what everybody talked about there, you know, they, they would give us intel and um, by the time you got there, there was absolutely nothing there. Uh, so the intel wasn't as, as great as it should have been. Uh, they, weren't, they weren't as dedicated I don't think to the cause as the Americans were. Uh, but on the other hand, there are the, the actual, and those I think were the, again, more the inline troops. You know, again, many of them were drafted, put into service, and they, had, they didn't, they didn't want to be there any more than some of the U.S. military. But there was one occasion we, uh, we, uh, our, our infantry had captured a couple of Viet Cong, and uh, uh, they were being interrogated by the uh, um, uh, Vietnamese uh, regulars. And uh, some of those could be extremely tough. I mean, uh, they they would go to the extreme on on occasions, and they, the interrogations were pretty extreme. And uh, they got one of the Viet Cong to say that he knew where uh, an ammo satch was, uh, where they could find a bunch of weapons, and uh, uh, some Viet Cong were hiding out. And uh, they dispatched my aircraft with me on board as the gunner. Uh, to go locate this guy with this guy's help, um, but to be honest, it wasn't. I think this guy was just saying whatever he could say. We never really did find anything, and I, I was over in the cubby hole, you know, manning my gun, and uh, I looked back, you know, and the, and the Vietnamese regular was interrogating rather intensely, and I looked back to patrol my area, and the last thing I remember was the Viet Cong. Uh, coming out of the side of the aircraft, and uh, they say he jumped, and uh, I'm not sure that was the case, but there's no proof to that matter. But that was how the the nationals um, sometimes treated, you know, the enemy combatants. Kind of a reminder of what a nasty business war can sometimes be, yeah. and especially a civil war, which on some level is what that was. Right. No, our, uh, many of our aircraft were sh uh, were damaged or sh I mean, so I, I've got pictures of bullet holes coming through. I had an M60 machine gun, and uh, of course we'd man that, and then we'd we'd go into a hot LZ. We would fire, laying suppressive fire, uh, taking hits. So you could you could actually hear them popping into the side of the aircraft, uh, whizzing by your head. Um, again, being a backwoods young kid, I didn't I thought I was invincible, so. They would provide you with what they called at that time chicken plates or armor plating. Uh, I never wore that. I just, uh, you know, I, I, again, I felt invincible. Nothing was going to harm me. I'd go out there. Or, uh, I would stand on the side of the skids, um, going into hot LZs because I thought I could do a better job of finding the enemy and, and laying down suppressive fire with uh, using Thompson submachine guns or uh, grease gun or just my M60 or my M16s, um, you know, and with bullets whizzing all around me. And one time I locked my uh, M60 back into place and six rounds come right up through where my head would have been over, you know, as I was firing the M60 and uh, I locked it, laid back, and six rounds come right through that, right through our fuel tank, right through, our, I mean, there's a pattern of six bullet holes right there. Um, there were a number of occasions where, uh, so we had troops that were injured, we had to go in and pick up our, our infantry in, in hot LZs. Uh, Seems like most of the time, especially that time of, of, uh, of the war, um, we seem to be taking a lot more casualties, a lot more hits than some of the other units further south. Uh, uh, now, did you yourself ever get hit? Never got hurt. And that's, again, I guess why I thought I was invincible. I had many close calls, but uh, we landed one LZ to uh, 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 pick up our troops. A hot LZ, they were being fired at. We knew it was hot. We came in. and. Um, we touched down on the ground, the troops were, drump, were jumping in, and a mortar landed uh, about four feet in front of us. <coughs> uh, 
uh, took out, <coughs> excuse me, took out all the uh, the windshields, the glass, the the side doors were all buckled. The front of the aircraft was completely buckled. We had trap metal everywhere, yet the aircraft was still running. And uh, we were still, I mean, I was actually hanging on to guys. They were hanging on to the skids trying to get in the aircraft to get out of there. It was such a hot LZ. Uh, rounds going off everywhere, uh, uh, Willie Pete grenades. Um, and that mortar went off. And even wearing a, a uh, at that time it was called, it was called an SPH-4 helmet, which was a, um, supposed to be an anti-ballistic uh, helmet for flying. Um, the noise was so loud that you know, I couldn't hear anything. And the pilots took off, even with the windshields were gone. I said the nose buckled. Uh, uh, we, we knew we had to get out of there because other aircraft were coming in behind us to pick up their, their troops. And as soon as we took off, the aircraft shuddered and shook like we thought we were going to fall right out of the sky. It was all we could do to get in the air. And uh, I'm hanging on to, actually, well, I got one guy, I'm hanging on to his, to his uh, ammo belt you know, keep him from falling out of the aircraft because they were just hanging everywhere to get out of there. Probably had 14 or 15 troops on board. Again, we never carried more than 13, and even that was a tough uh, go. And um, we got, I think we got about 55 knots, and the aircraft was shaking so bad uh, we thought it was just going to fly apart. And uh, Cobras had been laying down suppressive fire as, as we took off, and uh, one of his Cobras came up alongside of us and said, uh, guys, we need to you guys need to sit down somewhere. Uh, there's pieces flying everywhere. <coughs> so uh, they went, went ahead and uh, found a, uh, a spot that we could actually sit down in, even though we knew it still could. I mean, we weren't that far away, maybe three or four clicks away. And the Viet Cong were so heavily into that last LZ that it would take them no time to, to reach us. But uh, we sat down, and uh, our infantry got out and set up a perimeter and uh, we sh shut the aircraft down, and we're missing. We realized that uh, we're missing three feet of uh, both blades. Uh, com the the r mortar had landed just about four or five feet in front of us, with the blades turning, and the impact took rocks and trap metal right up, and, and it would just took off three feet of both blades. So we're flying. I mean, we needed all the blade to fly with that many troops, and to be missing three feet of it was uh, unimaginable that we we're still flying. Um, but we had to get out of there, so uh, I got up there with a pair of pliers. And uh, rotor blades are uh, basically a honeycomb in interior with uh, a aluminum and magnesium sh uh, skin on the outside, and it was all jagged. <coughs> and I got there with pliers and, and cut away and straightened as much as I could, and the one blade had more missing than the other, so it was completely out of balance. So I took uh, what we called 100 mile hour tape, which basically duct tape, but it was but a little bit better adhesive power, and I wrapped that around the blades, trying to visi visibly watch it till I got it close enough to level, you know, with uh, rounds of uh, winds of tape on that blade to get it so it somewhat balanced, and, uh, and then we took off again and uh, tried to get back to base camp, uh, which we succeeded in doing. We still could only do about 60, 65 knots uh, with the gunships flying around us, you know, giving us uh, cover and protection. Uh, until we got back to base camp. Was that sort of the scariest incident or the most dangerous one in terms of flying? You know, I really was not uh, all that scared. It's, uh, again, I guess the immaturity and the backwoods uh, uh, lifestyle. I, did, I really wasn't scared. I was I, uh, a lot of adrenaline, um, actually more excitement. Uh, you know, we'd, we'd had a lot of close encounters, had a lot of fire, but uh, to have that come that close, it actually, uh, I, I wanted more, to be honest with you. I, I was ready to go back out. Uh, when we landed at base camp, uh, I asked if there was any aircraft available, you know, so I could uh, continue to fly while mine was being repaired. So. All right. Uh, now, over the course of that year while you were out there, uh, did you get any RR time or time away from the front line area? There, there was time available. Uh, I didn't take any. Uh, Basically because, uh, again, being uh, very young, uh, I had a family, um, uh, a new daughter. I knew money was what we needed more than anything. Um, so we, we pretty much, uh, it could, to go on R&R was meaning you're going to have to spend money to do that. Uh, so I stayed there almost the entire year without any time off, other than 
local time, they give they actually required me to take uh, uh, you know four or five days off, and I'd stay right there in base camp and listen to music, <coughs> listen to music, and uh, go to the NCO club. Uh. One of the sort of standard cliches, and it seems to be largely cliche, uh, about sort of soldiers in Vietnam and so forth is that you know they were drinking, doing drugs, doing all sorts of things, uh, especially when, when when they were off duty or. Uh, on the other hand, a lot of people will tell you well, that really tends not to happen a whole lot when they're up on the front lines or anywhere near them. Uh, what, basically, what would go on in the base camp during quiet times? What did people actually do? Um, most of the time, it, it, it was drinking. That was your release, you know. Um, of course, the military made it very inexpensive for you uh, to buy alcohol. Um, a case of beer, I think, was... Um, Three dollars and twenty-five cents for a case of, of beer. Um, cigarettes were free. Um, alcohol was, you know, three or four dollars for a, a quart of alcohol. Um, so they made that, unfortunately, readily available and fairly inexpensive. But again, being so young and I did not drink, I did pick up smoking only because everybody else seemed to do that. I thought, well, it must be the in thing. So and, it, and the cigarettes were free. It's something I didn't have to pay for. Uh, so I did take up smoking, uh, but uh, the guys I hung around with, uh, again, the little, everybody found their little cliques. There were groups that tend to smoke a lot of hashish and marijuana, other groups that tend to drink a lot, you know, when they were free. Um, they, I, I had three or four guys that we hung around with, and we'd just sit around and listen to music and talk about things back home, and um, we'd go out and work on our aircraft. That was our off time. Uh, People uh, couldn't believe that I'd actually go out there and, and wash and wax my helicopter during my down days. You know, uh, I took pride in it. I, it was it was my pride and joy. I wanted that thing to be the best of all the aircraft. So I spent even my free time during the day, uh, you know, out on the uh, airfield, and I went through that aircraft uh, every every safety wire, every nut and bolt to make sure that nothing was going to come off, and nothing was going to go wrong. Do you think that for you that was kind of a, a good way to keep your head on straight or to, to stay focused? Yeah, it what gave me purpose. You know, again, uh, uh, I've always had this thing about uh, doing the best no matter what it is. You know, being the top uh, of whatever I can do and making sure that what I'm responsible for, you know, that you know, no one's going to come back and say, well, that that didn't work or that, didn't, that wasn't any good. So. Um, you know, I very seldom would, you know, I'd be out there all day long, and it was, uh, you know, several of my crew chief buddies, uh, we, we would go out there and just hang out in the aircraft, going through our log books, um, reading manuals. We would actually quiz each other on, 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 on uh, test questions out of the manuals um, just to keep ourselves sharp, and, and uh, sometimes we would take apart components that weren't necessarily needed to be cleaned or repaired or replaced, but just to make sure that you know, there was nothing wrong with them, and we, we would do that in uh, in pairs, and and or two or three of us together would go over to a, uh, one of the other guys' aircraft and just scour it, work it over. Now, did you also have a sense that a lot of other people depended on you? What you did affected a lot of people beyond just yourself. Yeah, I think that was one of the big causes too. I mean, aside from wanting to be the best, it was knowing that you know my aircraft, um, if it failed, there were. 10 to 13 troops that, besides the pilot and co-pilot and a gunner, that could perish, or we may have, you know, what if it broke down uh, at base camp? We couldn't pick these guys up when they're calling us in. Uh, so I, I felt that, you know, my aircraft was uh, was instrumental. It needed to be in the top, and uh, and I needed to be with it no matter where it went. I never, my, air, my aircraft never flew without me. It's very unusual for uh, helicopters. Uh, uh, sometimes when guys would go on uh, 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 on leave, R and R, or somebody else would crew their aircraft, or they'd bring in. Uh, you'd have a second crew chief in some cases, so you know you'd crew it uh, on odd days and you'd crew it on even days. And I, I never, my aircraft never flew without me. I always flew on it every day, almost every day. There's three or four days where they'd be in for depot maintenance, uh, repairing sheet metal or. Twice we uh, we actually 
uh, had to have a tail boom replaced because we landed in a uh, in a uh, fresh new LZ where they use a, a 500 pound daisy picker to to cut an area which would knock down trees and leave them about three to five feet high with actually stumps and uh, had a brand new pilot come in uh, fresh in Vietnam <coughs> and he was flying with us and I told him to flare flare and then I told him to pick up and he misunderstood my communication and we land right on a stump uh, around the tail boom and so I told him to lift up he pulled forward and just ripped the whole bottom of the tail boom off luckily no control damage but uh, so twice same pilot we did we had to have tail booms replaced because of him so then it would be down for four or five days but uh, again I would never leave the aircraft even when it was doing depot maintenance I was actually in there wrenching with the uh, civilian contractors who were doing transmission overhauls and replacing tail booms. I, I wanted to see everything they did and make sure that it was done th the right way. Alright, now how much contact did you have with home during that year when you were over there? Um, other than letters, none. Uh, so you didn't get a chance to make a phone call or anything else like that? No. Okay. No. It was one of those things where the, uh, we were gone so much and then when you came back to base camp they did have um, radio setup you could do radio phone calls but you had to put your name on a list and wait for that and sometimes it could be three four five days before your name would come up and then I'd already be gone on another mission how regular were the, were, were the letters it would vary um, you know you get stacks of them at a time because they, they get held up and then all of a sudden you'd get three or four letters at, you know, in a batch and then you wouldn't have anything uh, for a week to ten days um, and again a lot of times because we were in uh, 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 other base camps, um, you know, we'd have to wait another week to ten days before they would fly in our mail or in our our um, our sundry packets, you know, with our candy and cigarettes and stuff in them. So we wouldn't get those every day like a lot of the other units, you know. Now, did you have much of a sense during that year when you were there, sort of how the, the larger war was actually going, or whether or not what you were doing was accomplishing much? I thought we were doing everything we could do uh, uh, overall, not just our unit, um, but the military, until um, uh, we were sitting waiting to extract our unit, our, our infantry, and um, we were occasionally we would go to sit around an aircraft and turn the radios on and listen to uh, the chatter, what was going on around us. And um, we'd hear some radio communications and from base camps to uh, at headquarters actually back to the units that were uh, actually usually the infantry themselves and some of the things that would transpire over the radio um, I started to get disheartened with uh, the way things was in some cases were being handled where units were being overrun and calling for ext extraction or uh, assistance and headquarters saying um, just man it up man it up you know fight it out um, can't help you and here we'd sit within a matter of 15, 20 minutes from their location where we could provide support, but uh, and we'd call and, and, and let them know that we were available. Uh, they, they refused to take assistance. Uh, and, I, and I couldn't understand why some of those cases would take place, you know. I mean, uh, again, not knowing the inner workings of some of those uh, uh, commanders and how they would work and how they do things um, and what those units were supposed to do, but I just felt like in many cases, uh, some of these units were thrown to their wolves, and then when they needed assistance, assistance was w wouldn't arrive. No, is that more likely to happen in the latter part of your tour or early, or just about early? midway through? Um, we seem to hear more of that um, about uh, early '69. Okay, so sort of this is now your your, your after Tet and all of that, or mm -hmm. uh, and it's still, but fighting is still very intense. There was a lot of it going on. Yes. In that particular phase of, of the war. All right, now. What sort of toll did a year out there in the field have on you? Did you wear down at all, either physically or mentally? Uh, or do you think, as far as you could tell, you were in as good a condition to operate effectively 11 months in as you had been, say, three months in? I think um, missing home, um, the stress of not having decent meals, um, eating, uh, sea rations and uh, you know it seemed to seem 
to me that we ate more sea rations than we should have had to uh, at times. Uh, um, sometimes not getting uh, proper hygiene. I'm, uh, I, I think to this day, I have to have a shower every day and I think it's because of Vietnam. Having to wear wet clothes clean. We, when we were back at, ba at base camp, we did have um, maid service. They would have hooch maids who would come in while you were gone. You'd set your clothes in a, in a, in a, in a corner and they would go out and wash your clothes and uh, fold them for you when they come back, shine your boots. You always had two pair of boots. A pair of boots would be sitting there and they'd come back and they'd be shined. When we were back in base camp, obviously. Um, but most of the time, those clothes were always wet. So you were always putting on wet clothes. I just wanted dry clothes so bad, and I wanted to take a shower. We did have hot showers uh, at base camp, but uh, again, you stood in line for those, and um, they weren't always hot, um, and uh, you just never felt clean even after a shower. You know, it's I did it so when I came back to Vietnam, I I, uh, I got to have clean clothes every day. I got to have to shower every day. I've got to feel that I'm clean all the time. Now, as your year in Vietnam kind of got toward its end, did they change your assignments, or did you do anything differently in the last month or so earlier? The last couple of months seemed to be like uh, they, we were getting um, less and less heavy combat um, uh, requirements, and we're doing a lot more BS. Uh, again, it was, I think it was the, at the time the infantry commander, uh, the 4th Division commander, uh, didn't really understand the role of, uh, of an air cab unit and uh, we seem to be going back and reworking areas that we'd already worked and um, go out and spend you know a week and a half two weeks working a grid knowing there was absolutely nothing going to be in there and people were starting to get the idea like you know it's just they don't want us here they're wasting our time and you know what are we doing people didn't want to go out and fly missions you know they're actually uh, calling in sick, basically just saying, you know, I'm, I've got upset stomach, I, don't, I can't fly today. And we, we, for a while there would be times when we'd need two scouts uh, with two in reserve, two guns with two in reserve, a command control a helicopter, and then all the lift birds. And uh, we were going out with 50% uh, of our capability because people were uh, finding excuses not to go out. So at some point there is a certain morale cost or something about shifting yeah, and, and I think a lot of that, and I, and I believe this because I later on, uh, having been a detachment commander and uh, being in charge of units, uh, it all goes back to that that commander. You know, uh, how he treats his troops uh, and and uh, the kind of information they get. You know, uh, when we would get information about a, a particular uh, mission, and they would detail about where they suspected enemy was, what we needed to do. Uh, what we had in reserve, what units were going to be follow up and back up to us. Uh, you felt the purpose and you could go out there and do your job. But when you just, they come out and say, okay, we're going today. Where are we going? Don't know. So they'll brief us in air. What are we going to do? I don't know. When we get there, they'll tell us. There's just no purpose in it. You know, you needed to have that reason for going to begin with. And then, you know, having pieces of information along the way just wasn't adequate. Now, are there other particular incidents or things that happened to you during that year in Vietnam that kind of stand out in your memory that you haven't uh, brought up here yet? There was one uh, time I was flying. I did a lot of uh, command and control. I, I, I'd volunteer my aircraft for command and control. I had a, uh, about three months in, they uh, changed engines, and I got one of the brand new H model engines, which had more power. So. Uh, my aircraft had more power than most. Everybody wanted to fly it, but the air mission commanders or the uh, platoon leaders uh, particularly wanted, to, wanted my aircraft. Um, so they, uh, the air mission commander would usually fly command and control. That would be the aircraft that would basically fly a little above everybody else, control the air of the aircraft. Okay, you need to go over here and work this grid. Keep an eye on the other aircraft. Call in the, uh, uh, the, the gunships when, in, when you saw fire. And, um, we had two scout birds working uh, an area. Uh, we didn't have a lot of information about it other than there were some uh, known Viet Cong in the area. Um, we took uh, some small arms fire, but it was very sporadic, nothing intense. So we didn't think there was any large units in there. And our, my goal, or my, my job at that time, um, was to keep track of, of the aircraft. 
you know, air, air mission commander would be flying around and they're busy looking at maps and, and doing everything. And my job was to keep an eye on the two scout birds and they would fly basically over top of the trees. And uh, I lost track of one and we and I told the air mission commander, I said, well, I, you know, I've lost one of the birds, you need to circle back to the left. And uh, circle back to the left, kept circling, circling, and fi finally uh, we saw a wisp of smoke coming up uh, through the trees. Um, and this, I mean, this was a very, very dense jungle. Um, you couldn't see the ground at all, no matter where you hovered to. Uh, we couldn't, we flew right over the smoke, and uh, occasionally we'd get some small arms fire going off and uh, some tracers coming at us, but we could not see what was smoke coming from, but you know, there was definitely one scout bird missing. Um, our infantry would, were still probably 30 minutes away. Um, so the Air Mission Commander asked me if uh, I would volunteer to rappel down into the jungle and, and go in and see what, what, what had happened. And uh, again, being young and immature, uh, I, I thought, rappel that, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. Uh, the problem was we needed to find a place um, that was, wasn't as dense that I could get through the, the, uh, the jungle, uh, through the trees. And uh, so I rappelled down with an M60 and or an M16 and, and two bandoliers of uh, ammunition, um, and got into the top of the trees and then lowered my doubt myself down through into the trees. Uh, you have no radio contact, so the power. Emergency point where we have a missing break. Um, so I rappelled down, I got within about five feet of the ground, which I was at the end of the rope, and again, pilots above cannot see through the trees, they have no idea, and I can't tell them, we have no radio contact to tell them to lower me a little further, so uh, I just went off into the end of the rope and landed on my rear end on the ground, and um, once they realized the, the rope was free, then they rolled it back up and, and, uh, and continued to circle around the area. The, unfortunately, the only area that they could find um, less dense for me to repel into was about a mile and a half maybe from the smoke. So um, I had to hump it through the dense jungle on foot, on ground, um, M60 in, or M16 in hand, uh, knowing that enemy was there, but I needed to get over to find that scout bird to see if there was any survivors. Um, you know, I was not a ground pounder, so I was uh, that, w during my entire tour, that was the one time that I think my heart jumped the most. I was uh, the most scared and I was uh, the most unsure of what to do. Um, and again, it's because it was so dense, I couldn't really, I couldn't see the smoke, so I just had to take my bearings from when I repelled about where I needed to go. And I slowly worked my way, you know, towards the, the downed aircraft. and. Uh, uh, when I got there, I realized there had been no survivors. Uh, the aircraft actually impacted a tree that was about uh, a very huge tree. It was about 20 foot in diameter, and um, uh, the aircraft that impacted it uh, uh, don't know whether they were shot down, uh, had uh, engine failure, or what happened. Uh, scout birds carried a lot of ammunition with them, a lot of Willie Peak grenades and uh, phosphorus grenades, uh, hand grenades, and the aircraft was on fire and all this ammunition was going off around me. But, you know, I had to get up close enough to make sure that, you know, there was no survivors. So I worked my way up there with rounds going, whizzing by me from this, this aircraft as fire uh, sparked off the, the ammunition. And uh, got up to the, uh, to the scout uh, on the right side. And uh, he had impacted the tree so hard that uh, his helmet had split in half. And half his helmet was stuck in the tree. And uh, so I pulled him out of the aircraft, laid him down, and then went around to the other side. And uh, the cyclic stick uh, for the aircraft had impacted into the, the pilot's chest. So it took me some while to get him off of that, and uh, I pulled him out, and then I covered him with their ponchos. 
and uh, then went back to the aircraft and, and uh, popped the smoke so they could, and at that time, uh, they had gone gone back and got a rope ladder and had another command and control bird come in and take place. They got a rope ladder and lowered the rope ladder and I climbed back up and, uh, and let them know that, you know, I secured the two bodies and they, they did not survive. The aircraft was, uh, was uh, a total. Um, and uh, so they asked me to go back down, uh, get the dog tags, um, and, and to secure uh, any weapons, make sure that if they were not, uh, if they were still functional, uh, to destroy those. Uh, and so I did that, got the dog tags and came back and went up the rope ladder again. And then we uh, located a, an LZ big enough that uh, aircraft could actually land in. It was a, a now it's about five or six clicks away. We brought her in their infantry so they could go in and retrieve the body. And uh, surprisingly, uh, the air, air mission commander now decides that we're going to go back to the to play two, uh, not to the base camp uh, that we were working out of right to right to camp uh, play two. And uh, instead of landing in in uh, near our revetment, you always had areas where every aircraft would park, and there were sandbags uh, and. Uh, 55 gallon drums and you would land between those and uh, this time instead of landing at the uh, in my revetment for my aircraft um, we landed up near the headquarters building and I'm assuming for the air mission commander to get out and, and uh, report what had happened um, and when we landed we shut the aircraft down the air mission commander looked back at me and said Joe you need to get out uh, go see that guy standing out there so I guess I am um, probably going to give an air mission report then. I get over there and realize, and, and I was so taken back, I don't remember the general's name. At the time, uh, that was the 4th Infantry Division general that uh, was standing there, a uh, two-star general. And um, he uh, called me up and called me to attention and uh, um, read off uh, an award and uh, gave me a bronze star with a V pinned it on my chest at that time. Well, that's the first time I'd ever gotten an award. I, award, I had no idea what it what that meant, and uh, I guess to get an impact award in Vietnam was, was pretty unique, and to get it from a two-star general was, was even more unique. So I don't think I, I still to this day don't think I did anything out of the ordinary. I did what I was, you know, was asked of me, and uh, you know, I, I probably would have felt better if I could have pulled them out alive, you know, but. Uh, still, it was a pretty challenging mission and assignment that you had there. You weren't yeah. trained in the, obviously the jungle or anything else like that. But you managed to sneak through there and, and physically get there and, and do that particular job. And that's pretty far beyond what even the conventional call to do. So. Plus, the other thing, of course, about decorations, a lot of people would just think that you probably could do it with a very secret or official leader. But that was just in places where the right people were not watching. Right. And here, at least, the officers could see it. And also, experienced officers knew how to report stuff. You know, that's meant, OK, you, know, you really did step up and do something exceptional. I wonder if I would have done that right. You know, you're not going to know. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, that certainly seems to be a case where you know, you know, you did the right thing. All right. Now, you finally you get to the end of your year in Vietnam. Uh, and you, did you get sent directly back to the States, or what happened when that year was, year was over? Yeah, I, I uh, rotated out uh, to my normal DROS. Um, uh, left that unit and uh, was reassigned as a as a, a crew chief on a helicopter at uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Did they let you go home? Yeah, yeah, they did. I, I, uh, we actually got 30 days vacation. So um, that's the great thing about the military is you had 30 days a year, and I always took full advantage of those. So, uh, and that was the first 30 days that I actually ever had entirely, and we took all 30 days in a row. Right. Did things seem different? Than they were when you left, you Well, yeah, they were in coming back was, um, again, I, I thought we were doing the right thing over there, and I, I thought for the most part, again, because they shielded us while you are in Vietnam, you don't know exactly what's going on. Peop new, tro new troops would come over and tell you it's, it, it was nightmare back in the United States, you're not going to like it, it's, things are, it's, not a, it's not a happy environment, you know, but you just shove that under the rug as being unimportant or not really true or just somebody making a story up and um, I, I guess I got that rude awakening when I came back uh, 
uh, they flew me into Oakland and uh, they huddled us in their little room and said, you need to get out of your military clothes. Uh, why? You know, well, you just trust me, you don't, you don't get dressed in your civilian clothes, you, you don't want to be in your military clothes. And we're going to rush you out of this building and you're going to sit here and wait until your aircraft is ready to take off, then you're going to run out to your aircraft. It's really, really weird. I don't know what's going on. Well, then we can hear all the the uh, demonstrators out in the hallways yelling. Um, some troops would, you know, would, were going to go get taxis to go home and stuff, and some of them still wearing wearing uniforms. And uh, so I walked out the door and stood in the hallway and watched as the demonstrators were calling soldiers that I'd come back with, you know, baby killers and all kinds of names, throwing blood, whether it be fake or not, I don't know, but it was red in color and throwing it on them and uh, hitting them with signs and, and it was uh, very disheartening. So I actually rushed back into the building in the room and shut the door because I, I, I didn't want to be a part of that and I didn't, didn't know what was going on. You know, I still was, to me, it didn't make any sense uh, what was happening. So I was, I was just, dis I wasn't unsure. I, di I, didn't, I didn't know what to think of it. So when it came time for uh, for my plane to leave, they you know, opened a side door onto the onto the tarmac and said, "That's your aircraft." Uh, it was a civilian aircraft. Uh, run out there, and they actually had a staircase. You walked up to the plane. It wasn't a skywalk or anything. And uh, so, I, and I brought back a souvenir from Vietnam. I, uh, uh, I, I there was a one time where we actually went in and uh, we caught a a lot of. Uh, Viet Cong, actually they were uh, NVA regulars, brand new troops in the open, and our gunships had uh, caught them in the open and uh, um, uh, we killed them all. There was uh, roughly a, a, about uh, two platoons, roughly 20 some individuals there, and, and killed them all in, uh, um, in an open. And so we landed our infantry down in there and make sure they were all dead, and uh, I got out and uh, because uh, again, I was air mission commander, or flying with the air mission commander, so I got to walk around. Well, that, that bird stayed there in the LZ, and we were on inspected bodies, and I was uh, collecting stuff from them. You know, I thought was unique, so I picked up some uh, a weapon, SKS, brand new. Um, you know, with the packs <coughs> and some other stuff. So I was bringing that stuff back with me, and lo and behold, uh, they of all things. And if you, if you think about it now, to bring back a weapon uh, from Vietnam, all you do was get an import-export license, cost you seven dollars and you actually carried it with you on the plane. So I'm <coughs> I've got an SKS on my shoulder and my duffel bag, and people aren't supposed to know I'm in the military and I'm rushing to an aircraft, you know, to get on board. And I actually climbed up the ladder, get inside the aircraft, and uh, they, uh, they said, well, you can't take that back to your seat. Give me your weapon. And they, they put it in the, the stewardess's clothes closet right up front. So there's my, you know, uh, a rifle <laughs> loaded right in the aircraft. So think uh, you could do that then, you know, in the compared to nowadays. And there was one seat on the plane empty, and I sat down in that seat. And the uh, guy next to me, I could tell, was military, you know, just from his look. He's in civilian clothes, but we never looked at each other. And we sat there and taxied off, and um, uh, finally he looked my way, I looked at his. And uh, I didn't tell the story earlier, but I'd actually went in the service uh, under the buddy plan. Um, one of my buddies from uh, my hometown, and I'd at that time, we both decided to go into service together, and we were promised we'd be in a buddy plan, and we went to basic training together. But what they don't tell you, a buddy plan means that's as far as you go. We went off different paths after that, and I never saw him, never spoke to him, never, never had any letters going back and forth. I don't know what happened to him, but there he was sitting in the seat next to me. Of all things, he was coming back from Korea, and I was coming back from Vietnam. And uh, of all things, to sit down next to him, both of us ending our tour duties, his in Korea and mine in Vietnam, and being on the same plane going home was, uh, uh, was something. Yeah. Now, how much time did you have after the enlistment when you got back? Um, I had a year left. Uh, I enlisted for three years. I spent a year going through AIT and basic training and, uh, and uh, almost a year uh, uh, just prior to going to Vietnam, then a year in Vietnam. So I still had a year left. and. Um, when I came back, uh, again, money was tight. I was, uh, uh, we had a child, and um, at the time they were offering a, a bonus if you re-enlisted, and you had to have uh, so much uh, 
you, had to, you couldn't just re-enlist, you, uh, you had to wait so long. So I had to wait uh, about five or six months and then I re-enlisted um, uh, for the maximum at that time, which was uh, uh, six years uh, and gave me uh, $10,000 um, cash, which after taxes and everything ended up with about $8,500. $8, to me, that was a, a ton of money back then. You know, so I did it just for that money. Not, I have not any idea that whether or not I want to stay in the military. I kind of figured I did. I liked what I was doing, being a crew chief, and uh, uh, I, I, I liked uh, being associated with the military, even though Vietnam was still negative and there's still a lot of going on about Vietnam. Uh, I still thought the military had done well by me, and, and I owed them something, uh, you know, especially since they were going to pay me to stay in, you know. All right. Now, uh, you said you went to Sign Fort Bragg. Mm -hmm. um, now, was that the only place you were stationed, or did you leave Vietnam? Oh, no. I, 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 I After Fort Bragg, I spent three years at Fort Bragg. And common thing, after 20 years in the military, we, we pretty much moved every three years. We, we, could, we could bank on that. Uh, in the Army, you could assume that uh, three years was the maximum of any place you were ever going to be. So um, we, never, we never unpacked everything fully. You go somewhere, you'd stay there, and you know, two, two and a half years, you know, you'd, you'd get orders. So uh, after Fort Bragg, I um, uh, went to uh, Germany. We spent three years in Germany. Uh, and which three years were those? So that was uh, 72 uh, to 75. Overall, it was. Uh, we enjoyed the tour in, in, in Germany. Uh, uh, you know, I, I now had a, a son besides a daughter, so I had two children. Uh, we looked at it as a learning experience being in Germany. We toured uh, and took our, our kids everywhere we went. Uh, uh, loved Germany. Loved for the most part. Loved the people of Germany. Unfortunately, we were in. Uh, again, I was assigned to another cab unit, and um, the cab unit's role. Uh, uh, this cab unit's role. Uh, and at the time, the Cold War is still going on, and so we're still basically enemies with uh, with Russia and uh, um, and East Germany. Um, we were responsible for what was known as the Pull the Gap. It was a area where, if there was going to be a war, the Russians and the East Germans were going to come through what was known as the Pull the Gap. And our our role uh, in life was to delay. Uh, them coming through the pole of the gap. We actually had um, uh, tank killers. So I, was, I was in an air cab unit assigned to an armor unit, uh, an armor uh, squadron, so I was an air cab troop. We were the only aviation unit, so our M60 tanks and our tank killers uh, would, and we trained for this, we'd go up there and spend 30 to 45 days training uh, every three months uh, how to stop the enemy could coming through there. Uh, the, the, the tank killers would uh, their goal was to blow up the tanks in the front of the formation, which is how they assumed they would be coming across uh, with their heavy tanks and artillery, to knock those out, to stop or slow down the traffic coming through, and then uh, our aircraft would go in and, and do strafe and runs on the enemy, uh, uh, smaller vehicles and the infantry, you know, and uh, they told us when we first got there that we, uh, if something was to happen, we had a life expectancy of three minutes. So it's something you just lived with. I mean, uh, again, I never thought that was ever going to happen. I could not see uh, a war with Russia, but we still trained for it every day. Okay. Now, uh, while you were stationed over there, because there was still war to stuff out with even in the Middle East, mm -hmm. so there's still a war there because there was a war going on. Uh, did that affect you at all in terms of alerts or anything else like that? Or not for us. Again, guys, our primary mission was to pull the gap. Uh, and we were constantly going to Graf or Hohenfelds to do uh, armor training. And uh, we were, it seemed to me, I spent more time in the field training for war than I ever spent back in base camp. A uh, little different, um, they would actually go in and set up tents and they'd have a mess hall. So it was a little bit different environment than you what you had in Vietnam, but it was still, I spent a lot of time uh, training. And uh, that was actually a good thing because you didn't have idle time. You're, uh, we were a well-honed fighting machine, you know, our troop was, and, and I was proud of everybody there, and uh, everybody respected that. They all, uh, we had, uh, we'd have parties when we come back, and the group would party together, and uh, um, 
you know, I got a lot of uh, unique experience out of that. I, I actually uh, went back to school. Um, I, first, I got my GED, and then I went back after I get my GED, and I said, you know, it's, that's just a piece of paper. I need to actually get my education. Uh, so I went back and, and finished my high school and got a diploma. Uh, and then uh, we actually had uh, Emory Riddle Aeronautical University uh, was, uh, they would have professors attached to it. So we'd go out and do training. They would set up a tent and we would go in and do uh, college classes uh, at night or early morning or whatever. So they would, they would have these set up during uh, uh, in between training missions. And uh, uh, so I got a, a two year degree uh, at you know, going to night school. Uh, and they, you know, and I look at it as they afforded me that, uh, they, that, uh, that capability of doing that. So I was gonna take full capability of, and get my degree. Uh, back state side, I uh, um, went back to Fort Rucker because I had so much experience as a, uh, as a crew chief and, and uh, maintenance background. They actually uh, assigned me as an instructor for um, uh, aircraft maintenance to train. Uh, actually, it was AIT training for OH-58s at the time. They got rid of the OH-6s. Uh, they'd since been replaced with uh, Scout Birds with uh, OH-58s. And I, was, I had been crewing both of those, uh, UH-1s and OH-58s. So they assigned me as an instructor. Okay. Now, at a certain point, you kind of change your specialization, I think, as you go to training. Uh, well, well, I went through a lot of different uh, training, different things. I always, again, I was always wanting to be, uh, uh, take that next level. So I volunteered, I took instructor training courses, um, uh, higher maintenance courses. Um, of course, I was also, like I said, working at night, getting my, uh, uh, my college degree. Um, I was always, looking for that little extra edge, you know, for, uh, to get that next rank. Because rank was, really required education, um, you know, training. What, what, you know, what did you do over and above the next guy to be promoted over, over him? You know, if you both of you were just, you know, just because you had five years in the service, you know, you had to have points. And the points came from extra training. Uh, uh, so I, I volunteered for a lot of extra training and curricular activities to, to get that extra edge. And I was actually um, 85 and 86 uh, in ahead of my peers. But at some point you also changed as a pilot, right? At, while I was at Fort Rucker, uh, being uh, training uh, enlisted to be uh, helicopter mechanics, um, I realized that you know the, the only thing for me at the rest of my career was going to be uh, an enlisted person, and, and that wasn't very limited, you know. Uh, once you, be, once you become a, a, a first sergeant or e, uh, E7s, uh, there wasn't much to that. And I wanted to fly. I mean, I'd been in the back uh, being a crew chief and, and, and been a number of occasions where they actually let me fly the aircraft. And I felt pretty confident and, and uh, maybe even cocky, you know, that I could actually fly this thing. Uh, so while I was at Fort Rucker, the, the warrant officer training was at Fort Rucker. Uh, so I approached them about, uh, going to flight school. Well, they had a rule at that time. You know, uh, they didn't want prior enlisted. Uh, the Vietnam had wound down. They had an overabundance of warrant officers they were actually getting rid of. Um, so to go to flight school at that time, they, uh, as a prior enlisted, they, they'd rather have fresh uh, people coming out of college, uh, you know, that, that didn't have any uh, bad habits, you know, as a, a, as a listed member. And uh, after about three months, I was actually approached, and they were putting together a pilot program, um, something the military decided to do, and actually put together an entire class of all prior enlisted. And um, so uh, they asked me to join this group if I want to go through this test pilot, and if, if we succeeded, you know, we, we'd uh, become pilots and, and be uh, W1s at the end of that. And uh, it was pretty unique. I went to, we had 34, uh, students all going to flight school together. All of us were uh, E5s or E6s uh, with um, anywhere from seven to 10 years prior enlisted experience. And uh, the test actually went rather well. Uh, most of us, because of our, our military background and, and knew the training that was involved and you know, we're not, uh, uh, we weren't bothered by people telling us you know, that our boots weren't shiny enough or you know, uh, we had to roll our socks tighter or our underwear weren't in line you know, our name tags weren't straight, you know, so almost, uh, we actually fared rather well in, in the, the training to be an officer. 
And in the flight training, we were even better because most of us, again, had been uh, prior enlisted, had been around helicopters. So uh, the, 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 uh, we graduated, we started off with 34 and we graduated 32. Um, typical um, warrant officer classes, uh, when they'd have all new, new students uh, fresh out of college or um, you know, maybe they were uh, ROTC graduates, um, they would start with a class of 30 to 35, and uh, by the time they graduated, they would have 12 to 15 because of the dropout rate. So you guys knew a whole lot about what it was like to actually be in a helicopter and what it felt like, and you know an awful lot of what happened when you got close to the pilots again than a fair amount of anything. Yeah, and it wasn't so much the about the aircraft. It was knowing um, that – because uh, unlike um, – Officers who went through flight school, they were already, they'd already went through officer training. Officer training was only three months. Flight training was nine months. So the first six months of your nine-month period was actually intense officer training. Um, you know, uh, attention to detail, uh, formation at 5.30 in the morning, um, and go run for five miles. Um, everything uh, that had to do with learning to be an officer, or I don't – to my, in my eyes, it was not learning to be an officer. It was just uh, um, learning a regiment, you know, learning the details, uh, n knowing what to expect and how to handle people. And so we would have to do that. And then as soon as that was done, go in, shower, and then rush to classes and do our aviation training that officers were doing. They were, they were at home with their wives, get up in the morning, shower, go have a nice meal, and then go to flight school classes and sit in a classroom. And we were competing with them, basically, as warrant officer candidates after being up for four or five hours with a, a strict physical and mental re regimen. I mean, we'd actually, they'd get us out in the morning in, uh, uh, um, in formation and then say, you've got five minutes to empty your locker out. And we'd have to rush up there and throw everything out of our locker onto the floor and come back out in formation. And they'd say, okay, you've got three minutes to put it back in place. We had to rush back up there and put everything back in place, and then they, they come through doing an inspection. So it, it, just mind games, you know, but it was uh, all uh, uh, something to influence your training. But to have to now contend with all the school book and learning, you know, uh, learning uh, uh, how to fly an aircraft, uh, learning uh, meteorology, learning instrument flying, you know, uh, all the things that a pilot needed to know, um, while officers that were taking the flight school portion of it, you know, do the training and then go home at night to their wives and nice home cooked meal. Um, my wife was living in the uh, uh, on base, but I didn't see her uh, for the first almost first six months. Um, you know, occasionally she would come out to where we had formation and wave. You know, but you know my kids would come out and say hi, but we didn't uh, pretty much didn't see them. We 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 lived in a barracks, uh, just like basic training only worse. Um, rather unique, and I guess uh, uh, based on my, my background and my experience level, uh, I graduated as a, as a W-1, which is where you start, up, start off at best, and uh, they immediately assigned me to Hunter Army Airfield, which is um, uh, Savannah, Georgia, and it was a new aviation unit. Uh, the Air Force had just moved out of Hunter, Hunter Airfield and turned over to the Army, so a, a new unit was assigned there. And uh, they gave me an assignment to go into Hunter Army Airfield. I'd never been there. I had no idea what to expect, but I'd heard good things about, you know, uh, that assignment was going to be really, really nice. I mean, you imagine, and I've never seen an Army base before actually in a town, you know, and this was neat. It was right in the town of Savannah, on the outskirts of Savannah. And when I got there as a, as a W-1, um, you know, typically you're going to, report to CW3s and CW4s, or you're going to report to lieutenants and captains, and you're, you're just going to be a pilot, and basically that's all you're going to do. Uh, they looked at my 10 years of aviation maintenance background, and as a W1, I was immediately thrust into a command position as a platoon leader in charge of uh, aircraft maintenance and about 36 crew chiefs um, as a W1. I mean, of course, it didn't really bother me. Again, I'd, I'd been a staff sergeant. I handled it the same as I did as a staff sergeant. Uh, uh, so I ran the, the uh, maintenance platoon uh, for about a year and a half as a W-1 and soon as a W-2, uh, which is a u very unusual to have a W-1 or even a W-2 hold a command position. 
Now, I'm watching a little bit um, on our, our time here and, yep. and so forth. Uh, basically, you stay in then once you become a pilot. How long did you stay in? Uh, I retired after 20 years. Uh, another tour in Germany, um, uh, a couple of stateside assignments. Um, had envisioned myself getting a fixed wing transition. I'd always been, always been rotary wing and I wanted to go to fly you know, regular aircraft. And uh, while I was in Germany, they, um, uh, my career manager back in the Pentagon, um, I knew rather well, was going to assign me uh, to Hawaii with a fixed wing transition en route. And uh, as we got ready to leave, leave Germany, he, uh, he ended up uh, being reassigned and I got a new career manager who said, no, no, your background. I, I later on became a safety officer too, so I did safety and accident investigation, actually aircraft crash uh, investigation. So because of my background, I was required uh, to be at uh, Fort Knox, Kentucky, and uh, Hawaii was out. So I got to Fort Knox. I said, you know, my 20 years is in. I'm putting in my retirement paper. So. All right. Now, when you're doing this interview in conjunction with the Elgin Michigan event uh, here in uh, West Michigan, and part of the purpose there is to kind of, well, effectively give a belated welcome back to Vietnam veterans and the like. And one of the things that we're interested in, uh, you told us part of it, perception you got was when you came back from Vietnam, you, you talked about that, that experience of going home and everything was closed and seeing the protesters and that kind of thing. Uh, the other side of it, uh, after you came back, uh, did you talk to anybody about what was the experience? Or did you just, either, either other military people or family or anything like that? Not really, no. Not until um, my reunion two years ago, I spoke very little about Vietnam, what had happened, what had what had transpired over there, it was, um, I felt something it was, it was in me that no one else needed to really know, and, and for the most part, it was, there was still a lot of negativity about Vietnam. Even years later, it's, it was as though you don't really want to let people know you're a veteran from Vietnam, you know, so just keep it quiet. Um, it wasn't until my reunion a couple of years ago that I was invited to that, and I went down there, and uh, everybody there, we all had a common cause and a common goal and a common thread, and we, we spoke openly about our tour. Finally, starting to actually talk a little bit about the experiences and so forth. So, how did you wind up uh, meeting up with the other veterans of your unit? They, uh, I guess, they'd done a web search and found my name. My name popped up, and um, they called me and asked me if I'd be interested in coming to a reunion. They, they actually had um, uh, six or seven of them, uh, and we're still locating people. So, I thought that was uh, interesting and unique to finally see these guys, and uh, so decided to go there and and. Uh, have a reunion, and it was actually held at uh, uh, Fort Campbell, Kentucky, which is the, uh, our unit was deactivated after Vietnam, then they reactivated the unit for Iraq and Afghanistan, so um, th then they're located out of Fort Campbell. So not only was it the, our old troops, uh, but we got to mix and talk to all the new troops of our unit, so that was a pretty unique experience. All right, uh, what sort of uh, response to the present-day soldiers have for you guys? Actually, like, um, and, I, and I thought they would kind of be like, oh, yeah, these old guys, you know, what do they know? No, they actually respected us. They, um, it, it's pretty amazing that uh, they would ask us questions, what happened, how things went over there, what, you know, how things are different now. Um, they treated us with uh, uh, just a lot of respect. I was really impressed. and. Uh, they and they still do. The, from the unit commanders on down to the individual soldiers, they they actually wear old Vietnam fatigues and and uh, at reunions for us. They come to uh, come to the uh, dinners, celebrations, and it's it's uh, very heartwarming to know that there's young guys out there that still respect the old guys for what they did. And uh, what do you think now of the way? I think it's great. I really do. And I, um, I utilize my ability uh, as the owner of a magazine, um, you know, uh, and also as a motorcycle rider to go to a lot of events, primarily military uh, or veteran oriented. And the outpouring of support and love uh, by the American people is, um, you know, something I wish we'd have had when we came back to Vietnam. 
but you can't go back and do that. But what they're doing now is uh, unprecedented. I, I guess the overflow from that, though, is that uh, because of the support they're giving to the Iraq and, and Afghanistan uh, troops that are returning, there's a lot more presence, there's a lot more um, thought going into the fact that uh, uh, Vietnam troops didn't get that. So we have a lot of people who come up to us, come up to me, they see, I wear a symbol that I was a veteran and, and, uh, and that I was in Vietnam now, because I'm proud of that fact now. And people come up and shake my hand and thank me for my service uh, and apologizing for how things were handled back then, even though many of them were not even born. Um, so that's, uh, that's very heartwarming, have people come up and thank you for what we did in Vietnam you know, over 40 years ago. Finally recognizing on some level to detach the war, which is a largely political thing, from people who have to go and fight it. Right. Yeah, it's, and it's what I explain. I, I, I do uh, some radio segments, and uh, I write a Veterans Corner in my magazine explaining veterans' uh, uh, benefits, where to go to get things. There are, there are a ton of homeless veterans out there, a lot of them from Vietnam, you know, that there are services, there's places for them to go. Um, so I use that, that Veterans Corner to, uh, uh, as a release for me and to help my fellow soldiers uh, uh, and to let them know that there are things out there, you know, and there are people out there that, that do care and, and understand, you know, what they went through. Also what I went through, but uh, again, I, I don't feel that it was uh, as negative for me as, as uh, when I listen to some other soldier stories and I uh, feel that they may have had a, a worse time and, and a harder time uh, than I did. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it.